quick show of hands, who keeps a to-do list? Yeah. Somewhere along the way, some of us got the idea that if we really wanted to get things done in life, we're going to have to remember what they are. For the rest of you, I suppose you have great memories. I'm not that way. I don't, you know, I didn't do hard drugs back in the 60s. I don't have the excuses that some that I run into do. In fact, I wasn't even born in the 60s. I was born in the 70s, in case you were wondering. Um, for me, I have to keep a list of things. There are seasons where I'm good at it. There are seasons where I'm not. And when I don't, I miss lots of opportunities. In fact, I had the blessing last year of being in a relationship with Ron Ramsey, who was a former bishop of our denomination. And we were doing a coaching session over the phone once a month. And when we began that relationship, he asked me for three things that, he would, that I wanted his help on. And I said, probably the number one thing right now is that I feel at the end of the week sometimes I didn't get everything done that I wanted to. And he says, all right. Well, here's a challenge. You like to read books? Yeah, I do. I want you to read a book called Getting Things Done by David Allen. Has anybody else read GTD, know the GTD process at all? My wife does. Why? Because I recommended it to her. Because it is a radically different way of thinking about it. And what David Allen suggests in the beginning of this is some of us have been taught how to use tools like Microsoft Outlook. And you create your to-do list. And, and you begin your day with ideas of what you want to do. He says, the problem in our world today is that things are too fluid around us. And while in the vacuum of your own quiet time in the morning or even the night before, you may feel like you've got a list of ideas of things you need to do. But our world is changing so fast around us that you can't just go with a static list that you started with. You've got to be able to adapt to the situation around you and new priorities that might come up along the day. And yes, it's good to know an idea of what you wanted to do, you may not be able to get them all done. And so I began this process of looking at ways to, to better organize things. And I have a little bit more peace about that. I'm not there yet, but I feel a little better. I thought back to a movie. Jonah wanted to watch the movie The Incredibles a couple days ago. And I love it. I'm, I'm all for Pixar movies. I enjoy watching animated things for kids because, you know, 10% of the content's really geared to the kids and the other 90% geared at the parents. Listen to the music that they play. They play our music. They know what they're doing. In the opening scenes of this, you see Mr. Incredible. Here's a new superhero who's able to do all kinds of great things. And he has one thing to do on this day that he has to remember. And he also has issues with remembering things. And he looks at his watch as different opportunities come up during the day. I've got time. I've got time. And so he goes from one crime scene to another helping out. And in the midst of one, he's solving another. He's shaking a cat out of a tree and then flips the tree over and stops the bad guys as they're on their way through. And as he's going to his last crime scene, a friend says, don't you need to be going somewhere? And it was the day of his wedding. And he was late for his wedding as he was solving one more crime and one more crime and one more crime. You see, the problem is we've got to remember to keep the main thing, the main thing. As you and I go through our lives, we may have task lists and things that we need to do. And they're all good and well. But we need to remember to keep the main thing, the main thing. And Jesus knew this. For many of us, if you're, if you're like me, Distractions absolutely tear you up. You've got in your mind a set of things you want to do, and when distractions come along the way, it, it bothers you. And Jesus was okay with the different opportunities. You see, Jesus didn't set up huge seminars and lecture halls and invite crowds of people to come. His teaching method was as he was going along the way. And if you go back to last fall when we were doing the series on your market set, go. We saw something in the last couple weeks that Jesus had set out on a mission. And he knew where he was going and what he needed to do. And he was traveling back to Jerusalem because he knew that when he got there, he was going to be sacrificed for you and I. 
And along the way, opportunities would come up. The last one we looked at was uh, as he came through Jericho. And there was a blind man sitting along the road. And Jesus was walking along. And the blind man had heard that Jesus was coming. And he would just shout out, Son of David, have mercy on me! And the disciples wanted to shut this guy up. Jesus is going somewhere. But Jesus knew he had time to rescue even this man. And so in the introduction this morning, Brian read about Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And we're going to take a look at what happened over the first three days, as it's recorded in Mark chapter 11. And it says that on that afternoon, that evening, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Jesus came in on Saturday, the Sabbath. And the first place he goes is into the temple. And everything is okay that day. Because it's the Sabbath. There's no other activity going on. And throughout this, as we read what happened that last week, Jesus didn't spend the night in Jerusalem. The city that was going to reject him, he didn't stay in every night. He went back out to Bethany, most likely to be with uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, to stay at their home, of which made some difficulty for Lazarus. He's already been raised from the dead by Jesus, and because of all that is happening, the chief priests and the Pharisees have decided it's time to try to put Lazarus out again. He's guilty by association. But it says here's what's happened the next day. So on Sunday morning, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. I don't know why. I don't know why Mary and Martha didn't make him a huge breakfast that morning. But it says that Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. I don't have a green thumb. I can't raise anything. If you've been around the church long, you know that I grew up in farming community in central Michigan. My mom worked at a grain elevator. Everybody else in my grade, except for three of us, rode a bus because they lived on farms, and I walked to school. I had no clue. I had no clue about farming. I tried raising. Did anybody else ever have a sensitive plant, those ones that you touch and all of a sudden the things close up? And they're supposed to live for a long time. Mine made it for about two weeks. Something about me, I don't know. Um, so I had to research this because I have read this story and it didn't make sense to me at first. And maybe it hasn't for you either. A couple things you need to know about these fig trees. Number one, it takes about three years from the time that you plant them until they finally begin to bear fruit. Three years. Watch it grow, watch it go dormant. Watch it grow, watch it go dormant. Watch it grow, hey, guess what? Something happens. Now, the other side of it, too, is that something happens. Now, some of you know, as you watch, when we lived in Traverse City, we had cherry orchard behind our house. It wasn't ours. Didn't have to pay for it. That was the nice part. Just watch it. There's certain things as you watch plants grow. Some do things in different ways. With a fig tree, when the leaves begin to come out, that's when the fruit begins also. Some trees fill out all the way, and then the fruit begins to grow. Not so with the fig tree. The fruit grows at the same time as the leaf. So if the leaves are full, then you expect that there's fruit. Now the problem is, it says this wasn't the season for it. This tree looked like it should have fruit growing on it from a distance. You would think that because it's fully in leaf. But it says that it wasn't. What's Jesus going to do? Jesus says to the tree, well, isn't that a funny picture? Jesus, the creator of the universe, talks to a tree. And he says to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Now, some of you know, some of you talk, all right, seriously, who talks to their plants? I saw a couple of hands go like this just now. You've heard the idea that Plants can hear you, and the atmosphere that they're in helps them to grow. 
I think this might be where we got the idea from. And Jesus says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Big deal, Jesus. Jesus yells at a tree. So what? Watch what happens. There's a reason Mark puts these things together. I think it's going to become obvious in just a moment. It says, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area. Well, he did that last night. But now it's Sunday. Now it's the start of the week. Things are back to normal now because something special is going to happen this week. It's Passover week. So everyone from all around who is a Jew is coming to the temple. That's one of the three times a year you would come to worship and celebrate. But to do that, you got to have the right offering. You got to have the right currency and animal. And you couldn't just bring anything. You had to have one that was raised there. You had to have the right currency. So Jesus sees an altogether different picture on Sunday than what he had seen on Saturday night when he came in. And here's what happens. He begins driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. Here's the picture. When you had the temple area as it was at that time, you had in the most special place what was called the Holy of Holies where the high priest would only go once a year to offer sacrifice for the sins of the entire nation. Outside of that, you had the holy place, which only the priests could go into. Way outside in the outer edge was called the Court of the Gentiles. And it was a place that anyone could come to pray. Remember, God's purpose for his people way back in the time of Abram, when he gave the promises that through you, all nations will be blessed. Your purpose is to show the way to those who don't know me how to live. And they'll receive a blessing through that. And so when you went through the age of the tabernacle and finally into the age of the temple, there was a place that was created for those outside of the Jewish nation to come and to worship God. Now, there was a wall that separated that from where the rest of the Jews could go and worship. And nice plaques on the wall that said that. But this was a place that was created for them to come and be near God. And the situation is such that in that place, you've got all kinds of chaos going on. Those who are cheating the people who have come, because you've got to have the right currency. So let's kind of take a cut off of that. You've got to have the right animals to sacrifice. So let's take a cut out of that. In fact, it's reported that this was a place, as you were trying to travel through Jerusalem, there were those who were just traveling through and making a shortcut. Picture that. If my door was unlocked up here, and people wanted to get back towards Rod and Deb's house, and as we were having our worship service here, there was a stream of people who just kind of walked in right past us here, and right out the back door and out. I mean, that'd be foolish. But that's what was happening in the place of worship. And Jesus says, this cannot be. Now, some people think that to get angry is, is wrong, that it's a sin. Well, it depends on how and what. What are you trying to achieve with that anger? Jesus is not happy with what he sees. And here's the thing about Jesus' ministry. He takes every opportunity and makes it a teaching moment. So as he has driven everybody out who shouldn't be there and restores order, he's teaching them. And he says, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you've made it a den of robbers. Jesus teaches, Why does this make such a big deal? Why is this so significant? Because this has been created to be a place for worship of God, and you've you've made it a place of just buying and selling. You've made it a place where if somebody wanted to come and worship, they couldn't. And that's why it's such a big deal. Of 
course, somebody gets mad. This was big business. This is on the first day of the week of when everybody's coming. If there's a season for making cash, this is it. Because all the foreigners are coming in. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. Now that's pretty strong. That's pretty strong. They're so upset over what Jesus is doing. They don't care what his motive is. But it says again at this point, they're looking for a way to kill him. And it says why. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And I think you can begin to see why Jesus has these two incidents together in the Gospel of Mark. Do you see the link between the fig tree and clearing the temple? See, here's the link. The fig tree looked like it should be bearing fruit. It looked like it should be mature. But it wasn't. The Pharisees, the chief priests, the teachers of the law are coming in. And they're supposed to be the mature ones. It's their job to teach people how to follow the way of God. But just like the fig tree, there's no fruit coming from them. And they're more concerned with what does the crowd say than what does God say. They're more concerned with the trivial things around them than what does it mean to really follow God. There's no fruit from, coming from them whatsoever. And it says that when evening came, they went out of the city. Jesus and his disciples are there all day long, teaching in the temple. And at night, they go back out to Bethany again. Verse 20, it says, In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Now, where does a tree grow from? From the roots. Where is the source of nutrients? What sustains it? The roots. And they can see that this tree that Jesus had cursed the day before is shriveling up from the roots up. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Yep. Yep. And what's Jesus' first response? Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Jesus is about to teach on something big. And the thing that he begins with is have faith in God. Too many times we want to approach tough situations in life. We want to approach something big. We start with, how can I go about this? What master plans do I need to put together to achieve this mission? And Jesus says to them, have faith in God. And listen to what he teaches. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will happen, it will be done for him picture. Jesus isn't just making up some off-the-wall illustration. Mount of all olives, just off to the side. See of Galilee that he can see. And Jesus says, have faith in God. Listen to what is possible. And Jesus doesn't really want them to try this. Okay, boys, get out your magic wands and wave them in the air and see, shazam, can you make it happen? That's not what Jesus is teaching. What he's teaching about is faith. Do you believe? Faith. Do you see why this fig tree was destroyed? Faith. It was, masquerade, it was masquerading as a real tree, as one that should be bearing fruit, but it bore none. So therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Jesus is teaching in a moment I'm saying, look at what's happened as an example. You have to believe. That's the first part. You've got a prayer list that we looked at. Number one, if we don't believe when we pray, 
if we don't believe as we pray for someone, if we don't believe that God wants to answer that prayer, should we be surprised if he doesn't? The number one condition for prayer to be answered is that you're in a right relationship with God and you believe that he's able. But Jesus goes on. He says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him. If you have anything against anyone, you go and forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. If you're looking in your Bible, you may not see verse 26 right in line. You have to look down at the bottom of the page. We talked about the 26,000 or so manuscripts that are available. Some include this verse, some do not. Verse 26 says, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven Forgive your sin. Here's the thing we've got to get. There is a condition in our prayer life that blocks God. He wants to, and he has the power to, but he explains here to us that when we harbor something against somebody else, if we don't go to them and forgive them, then you can pray all you want about moving a mountain. And it's not going to happen. God's desire is that for his people to live in harmony together. And harboring a grudge against somebody else is the number one way to see your prayers blocked. Jesus isn't so worried about moving mountains and throwing them into the sea. It's a beautiful mountain. Several people are on trips right now and just got back from trips to Jerusalem that I've seen on Facebook. It's a great season for going before Easter to get your heart and your mind ready for the experience. And seeing Sea of Galilee, it's awesome. Seeing the Mount of Olives, it's awesome. Jesus doesn't really want somebody to say, hey, take this and throw it over here. He created it. It's beautiful. But what he is saying is that our prayers have that kind of power because it says in his word that he's able to do beyond all we could ask or imagine. It's not that God's power is limited. But God does give a condition on his prayers of his people. And he says, in order for those prayers to be answered, you've got to believe and you need to resolve and forgive those who you have something against. And I just pray that for our church. I pray that blessing that as we gather today, that we can be that way. United in heart and mind and purpose of what Jesus Christ called us to be as believers in him. And that we would take to heart the words that he says on that day. The disciples are amazed. Look at the, Jesus, you just, you just said you talked to a tree yesterday, Jesus. We've seen all kinds of things. We've seen you perform miracles. You've calmed the sea. You've walked on it. You've fed thousands. Jesus, you've done amazing things. And you wanted to teach us by putting a tree to death. And Jesus' point is so clear. He says, I want your prayers to be heard. I want you to pray. I want you to believe and trust in me. He says, if you guys are going to live in disunity, if you guys are going to harbor things against each other, he says, understand that your Father in heaven is not going to answer those prayers. So I pray that for us today, as a body of believers, that we would be one in fellowship and united in serving him. The story goes on. And the Pharisees continue to not like the things that Jesus is doing. And they question his authority. By what authority are you doing these things? We begin to see their, their motives. Jesus throws a question back at them and says, well, I'll answer your question if you'll answer one of mine. John's ministry. Was it from God or from men? They scratch their heads. And they kind of get in a huddle and say, guys, what are we going to do here? We want to trap Jesus. We need to get rid of him. What he's doing is purely messing up our way of life. And here's the problem, though. If we say the ministry that John had was from God, which they believed, 
And he's going to ask, why didn't you do it? Don't you hate that when somebody asks you a question, they know what your answer is going to be? And I said, well, but if, if we say that it was from man, well, all these people around us believe that John came from God. And they simply answer, well, Jesus, we don't know. And I think that's the thing that we need to get to, because Jesus said, well, then I'm not going to answer you. Where are we at in our belief in what God has called to be? Jesus said, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your sins. And so I want to take a moment right now. I want you to, to do some introspective thinking. Because we don't do this enough. And I want to pause right now before we sing our last song. To give you a time... A silent prayer. And say, Lord, search me. The way that David wrote in the Old Testament, search me, Lord. And if there's something in me where I've lived with unforgiveness of somebody else, would you point that out to me? Now, if you're one of those people who makes a, a list of things, a, a to-do list like we talked about, put that on your list. Maybe you need to write it down, just a name on the back of your bulletin today. Here's somebody I need to go to and forgive. Because I want my prayers answered. And that's why Jesus is saying it. Jesus is going to do a lot more teaching on prayer with these guys in the next few days. And he says, I want you to understand, number one, God is able. God is able to do so many amazing things. But there's conditions if we're in the way that he won't answer those things. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment and allow you just to let God's spirit speak into you. Lord Jesus, today I thank you that we can gather as your people to worship you. I thank you for the examples that we have seen from your word. Lord, that you are able to do so many things. We've gone through the series in the fall in the first ten chapters of Mark, and we saw miracle after miracle. We saw you, Jesus, as a man of action. Jesus, thank you for those examples that we saw from your word. That Jesus, as we gather, we want to worship you and there's understanding from your word that we need to hear. That when we come, if we, if we harbor a grudge against others, then our worship is, is flawed. You want us to come with, with open hearts for you and a love for those around us. Jesus, it's why you put these two stories together as you taught from what was going on in your daily life. Jesus, you did it again as you wrote in Revelation. To the churches that needed to hear of the great things that had happened, but yet the things that were causing a, a break in their relationship with you. Today, Lord Jesus, we want to come to worship you. We want to come and have our prayers heard because you are an awesome God and you want to do through us so much. Lord, you need our hearts united that we would be ready to serve you. So help us, Lord, if, as you've caused maybe names to come to mind of people that we need to, to go and forgive. God, that we would be a people that would do that. And open the doors, Lord, for your blessings to pour in. God, as we begin this series of getting ready for Easter, may our hearts be ready for the King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord Jesus, that you would speak into our lives. Now as we worship you through song and through the giving of tithes and offerings, may you encourage us, Jesus. You are the Lord. You are the one that we come to adore. I give you praise in your strong name. Amen.